Okay, so now Marshall Allen. Uh, you guys, I hope, saw the bio. He's going to tell us more about his life and career in journalism. And I just want to say, I had the privilege to get to know Marshall in the last few years, and he used to work across the street. And I miss, since his office moved uptown, the fact that we don't get to get lunch as often these days. Um, so Marshall Allen, he's an award-winning journalist with ProPublica, uh, what I consider the nation's leading nonprofit journalism organization. Um, he covers healthcare for ProPublica and investigative uh, side of healthcare. And uh, his works appeared in places like the New York Times, USA Today. He's been on the Today Show talking about his work and many, many other outlets. Uh, he's been a Pulitzer Prize finalist and received the Goldsmith Prize for investigative reporting from the Harvard uh, University Kennedy School of Government. So with that, let's welcome Marshall Allen. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Jan. And thank you all for uh, coming tonight. It's a cold and rainy night. Um, it's an honor for me to talk to you. I, I do a lot of speaking about um, uh, the journalism we do at ProPublica, the medical, uh, investigative medical stories that we do um, at medical conferences or at journalism conferences. Uh, one thing I don't often get asked to speak about, though, is my faith and my journalism and the relationship between the two. And so it's really an honor uh, to be able to talk um, to you all about that here tonight. So a lot of you are uh, students, which is great, because I'm gearing uh, this whole thing toward you. Um, but I want to start off by telling you a story about the most, um, I would say, stunning question I ever got in a job interview. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're being interviewed for a job and you get a question that just sort of slaps you upside the head and you don't quite know how to respond to it. You just have to kind of catch your breath. Um, but it, this was about a dozen years ago, and I had been in journalism at this point for about two years. And I was applying for a job at the Pasadena Star News, which is a small newspaper in uh, Southern California. It's a small paper. It, if it sounds like a humble gig, it kind of was. I mean, the Pasadena Star News isn't some big nationally known media institution or something like that. Uh, but for me, it was a big step up. It was a daily paper. It was about 35,000 circulation. I believe it or not, I was at a daily paper of about 20,000 circulation. And before that, I had been at a twice-weekly paper of about maybe 8,000 circulation or something. So for me, um, this was like a gig I really wanted. And I knew this would be a good step up for me. Um, and in journalism, you kind of have to kind of climb that ladder to move up. Um, and I had passed through the initial interviews. So they had looked at my clips. I had gone to the main editor and the managing editor of that paper. But, the, but this was owned by a chain, and I had to get through this, uh, this top editor who was kind of the final uh, he really grill you, you know, they kind of warn me, like, this guy, you got to be careful, he's going to try and get under your skin. Um, so I, I had prepared myself for this guy. And he was this older, um, kind of like grizzled, veteran, old school uh, editor, right? The kind of guy, like, chewed up reporters and spit them out. Very intimidating personality. Um, so I, I was prepped, you know, I, I wasn't, like, afraid of the guy or anything, but um, he looks at my, um, my resume, and uh, he seemed to have kind of a scowl on his face, but to be fair, maybe he was just puzzled, you know, because my resume was a little unusual. Um, I had been in full-time ministry for five years on the staff with Young Life International, which is a big, um, large Christian youth organization, evangelical organization, and some of our Young Lifers uh, who work with my kids are here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, and I, three of those years were in Kenya, so um, I had, uh, missionary background, right? So three years with Young Life in Kenya, two years um, at Young Life headquarters. Um, then I had gone to seminary, to Fuller uh, Evangelical Seminary, which is uh, in Pasadena, California. At the time, it was the largest evangelical seminary in the country. I'm sure it still is probably the biggest one. I mean, I don't know for sure if it's still the biggest, but it's um, a big uh, evangelical school. And I had a master's degree in theology from Fuller. And he looks at me and he says, so what makes you think that a Christian can be a good journalist? And I was like, I mean, I didn't quite know what to say. I, I, I thought, such an unusual question. First of all, I thought, my first thought was, does his HR director know he's asking questions about my religion and implying I don't know what I'm doing? But because um, it wasn't really probably an appropriate question. Um, 
But at the same time, it was a fair question because, um, and, and I want to talk about, that's kind of the theme of what I want to talk about. What, what makes you think that a Christian can be a good journalist, right? Um, and it was an unusual question, and yet it wasn't. I mean, for, for whatever reason, um, there aren't a lot of people who are evangelical Christians who are in the mainstream media. So in a way, it was a very natural thing for him to ask. But on the other hand, uh, and the answer I gave him is that um, there's a lot of reasons why uh, it's pretty easy for a person who's uh, devoted to uh, Christ to be a good journalist in the mainstream media. Um, the Bible talks about telling the truth. I mean, that's a very fundamental Christian value. Journalism is about telling the truth. And these are the, this is the answer I gave to him. Um, you know, a, a Christian is supposed to be a person of good character and integrity. And in journalism, your character and your integrity and your reputation are really your only calling card that you have with your sources. If they trust you, they will call you back. If they don't trust you, they will never call you again. So as a, as a believer, if you're a person of character, um, that's going to help you in the field. Um, journalism is about speaking the truth to power, and that's also a very biblical uh, value, to have the courage um, as, a, uh, as a Christian to tell the truth no matter what the circumstances are, no matter who you're telling the truth to, that's a biblical value that's also consistent with journalis journalism. So I told the editor, I said, I'm not saying, I explained these things to the editor, and I said, I'm not saying you have to be a Christian to be a good journalist. I mean, obviously there are many, many excellent journalists um, who are not uh, Christians. But, you know, far from it being contrary to my faith, I mean, my faith is what makes me a better journalist. Um, and so I, th I think for me, being a Christian makes me a better reporter. And so I'm going to be better at delivering what you want for your newspaper. Well, he didn't, uh, he didn't actually give me any uh, response. You know, I sort of thought, well, what's he going to say? He didn't say anything, he didn't really react. I did get the job, um, which was very good. Uh, and so um, that was another uh, step in the process of kind of climbing the, uh, the career ladder for me. Um, that's, that's a funny, it's kind of a funny story, but it, it also it is a little misleading about what it's like for me to be a Christian in the media. Um, it always gets a reaction, you know, when I'm at a conference or, or something like that, and someone tells me, oh, what'd you do before you were in journalism? I say, oh, well, I did ministry, or I went to a seminary. That always, that always evokes a response from people. It's a good conversation starter. Um, and so I am something of, of a fish out of water, but at the same time, um, it's, it's not so unusual that people care that much about it. So I think sometimes we make too big of a deal about it, and people get too fixated on the whole thing. I think most of my colleagues don't really care at all. I mean, my editors, I think, don't really care at all. I think what they really want me to do is deliver really good stories. Um, so I always put my ministry experience and my seminary background um, in my professional bio, um, because so if you go on a ProPublica site and read my bio, I put it in there. Um, because I want to be open about my faith, I want to be a conversation starter. Um, but when people ask me, so how did you get into, how did you go from ministry to uh, muckraking, which I'll talk about tonight, um, I always tell them, well, do you want the spiritual answer or do you want the secular answer? Just give me an idea, because I can give you the Christian version of the story, or I can just tell you uh, the shorter version, which is going to be the more secular answer. Um, I'll give you the Christian version tonight. I'm going to give you the, the, full, uh, the full deal here tonight. Um, but as I considered what I would say tonight, I want to first talk about John McCandless Phillips, because he's kind of the reason that we're all here tonight, and it's this institute that's brought us all together. Um, I felt a little self-conscious, I feel a little self-conscious, giving any kind of lecture in the name of McCandless Phillips. Um, McCandless Phillips was this legendary reporter. I mean, there are, for those of you who don't know who he was, um, he was, uh, when people talk about the best reporters ever to work at the New York Times, they talk about McCandless Phillips. Nobody will, will, it will, I don't think will ever say that about me, and they certainly don't say that about me now. So just let me be clear, I'm not a legendary uh, reporter in the, uh, the genre of McCandless Phillips. They especially would talk about the beauty of his writing. Um, the former New York Times managing editor, um, Arthur Gelb, once called Phillips, the most original stylist I've ever edited. That's what they call him. The most original stylist I've ever edited. 
So um, there are some things that I really don't have in common with McCandless Phillips. We do have some things in common, um, or we, you know, our faith, our love for journalism, and our desire to see more young people go into the media. Um, I started in journalism in 2001, so that's when I graduated from seminary, and that's when I started in a small newspaper. And I heard about Michaelis Phillips, I think it was through the World Journalism Institute. It must have been about 2002 that I first heard about him. And I admired, uh, I, I didn't meet him, I just heard about him, and I read um, this Faith in the Daily News Chase uh, little booklet that, that they had produced based on one of his speeches. And I admired his dedication to the craft, I admired his, the way he uh, lived out his testimony in a very secular environment. Um, even to the point, you know, people would talk about how he kept a Bible on his desk, and I don't know if he read the Bible at all, but it, he was just very open about his faith. Um, so years later, I guess it was about a decade later, 2011, I moved here to um, this area to work at ProPublica here in New York City. And the first thing I wanted to do, one of the first things I wanted to do was, I was like, I gotta meet this McCandless Phillips, this legendary guy. I gotta find out if this guy will meet me and have lunch with me or have dinner with me or something. So I emailed him, and he was extremely gracious. Um, anybody who knows um, McCandless or what he was known for, he was really known for um, identifying younger uh, Christians uh, who are interested in journalism and then encouraging them and mentoring them. And so we had a dinner one night at Jan's house. This was just maybe a month or two after I had arrived. Um, and had a great time together. And he treated you like, uh, like you were his child almost. I mean, he was so gracious and so encouraging. It was like he was proud of you without even knowing you, you know. And um, it was, it was uh, just the kind of guy who you felt very uh, humbled and uh, like he was such a gracious uh, personality. And then he would send me occasional emails. Um, we never had a close relationship. Um, but he would send me occasional emails and be encouraging and things like that, and I just really admired what he did. So that's kind of the spirit I want to try and talk to um, here tonight. I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased it's mostly young people and mostly students in the audience. I don't know where you guys are at or what you're considering doing with your life. Um, as you'll hear from my story, this was never really my plan either to go into journalism, but what I think all of us need to do is just really um, uh, submit our will to God's will and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. Um, and so as you pursue that, if journalism is something that you feel God leading you to do, um, I'd love to talk to you about it. I know Paul would love to talk to you about it and others. Um, but I think one of my goals here is to uh, destigmatize it a little bit uh, and to kind of say like, you know what? Not only um, is it okay to be a Christian in the media, I think that it is entirely consistent uh, with our faith, and I think the mission of what journalists do is as consistent with, uh, with uh, my faith as a believer as um, any other industry that someone would go into. Um, I have a lot of uh, Christian friends who are my age, I talk to them about what they do. Uh, man, you try working for a big uh, corporation, and you tell me that a Christian isn't going to have some, uh, some ethical and <laughs> challenges in that environment. I actually think I have it a lot easier in the media with what I do than um, some of my friends who work uh, for some companies that have some unscrupulous standards, and I'm going to explain that um, tonight. Uh, so here's, here's why I think um, it's, it's easier, uh, because what we do as journalists is very consistent, just as I answered that editor in that job interview, with what the Bible teaches us to do as believers. Um, and I wanted to start with... Um, uh, a word that sometimes some people think is a negative word, and we put it in our title, the word muckraking, okay? Uh, we put it in the, the title of the talk, even over the, the fears of my own mother, okay? My own mother, I told her, I'm going to call this from ministry to muckraking, and my own mother was like, muckraking? I mean, my brother said this too, actually. Uh, muckraking, I mean, that's such a negative word. It's such a, and I said, well, it does have some really negative connotations. Certain definitions of it are very negative. Um, let's see if I got this right here. Okay, there we go. Here's the definition I'm using. This is the Merriam-Webster definition. It's not just one I made up myself. Um, but the definition of muckrake, it's a verb, to search out and publicly expose real or apparent misconduct of a prominent individual or business. Now, does that sound like the activity that a good Christian should be doing? I don't know. Sounds kind of controversial, doesn't it? Let's read it again to search out and publicly expose real or apparent misconduct of a prominent individual or business. Um, 
ProPublica's mission statement is to expose abuses of power and betrayals of the public trust by government, business, and other institutions using the moral force of investigative reporting to spur reform through the sustained spotlighting of wrongdoing. So ProPublica's mission statement is to expose abuses of power, betrayals of the public trust, using the moral force of investigative journalism to spur reform through the sustained spotlighting of wrongdoing. So I'm talking about um, fairly and accurately exposing wrongdoing. I'm not talking about sensationalizing facts. I'm not talking about twisting facts to fit your agenda. I'm talking about the dogged pursuit of the truth and the willingness to publish whatever it says. And if the truth turns out not to be consistent with your story, then you kill your story. You don't publish things that aren't true. You don't slam things in a way that's not, that, that's not honest. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, how I went from ministry into this business of muckraking. So before I start with where I'm at now, I want to start back with where I was when I was almost closer to probably a lot of your ages and talk about how I got into journalism in the first place. Um, there's a, a few stories I want to tell. Um, you know, one thing when I write a profile, I don't know how many of you guys have done profiles of people, but one of my favorite things to do when I do a profile of someone or I'm interviewing someone and I really want to get to know them is I like to ask them, what are the experiences you had in your childhood or when you were a young person that you look back on now and see that there were these key moments and these key points that got you to where you're at today? Try that at your next like dinner party or something, when you're hanging out with someone and you want to get to know someone and you want to drill down deep, okay? This is what reporters do. We start interrogating people at dinner parties. <laughs> but I want you to just ask them, so what are the things, you look at your life now, think back to when you were a kid. What were the things that happened to you that made you who you are today? So I'm gonna tell you a few of these things. The first one, and my kids will laugh when they hear this because I tell these stories all the time to my kids. Um, was about getting bullied when I was in seventh grade. Okay, when I was in seventh grade, believe it or not, I was kind of a dorky kid. Um, I know I don't probably seem that way, right? But I was a dorky seventh grader, probably just like uh, a lot of people are. Um, and uh, there was this bully in our school, eighth grade kid, big kid, um, and I was a skinny little seventh grade kid. Anyway, this bully, what he would like to do is he'd pick someone different all the time and he'd go up to you and his sort of MO was to grab you, get you in a headlock, and then he'd just like spit on your head. He'd hock a big old loogie and he'd spit it right on your head. Okay, that was this bully's style. Um, so, and he was known for it, right? So you don't, you know what's coming when he comes your way. Uh, and I'm standing there by the tennis courts with my buddy Tim out on lunch, minding my own business, I can promise you. And this bully comes ambling over and he's got two little sidekicks with him. Uh, and he starts, you know, pushing, he, there's a, there's a buildup to the spitting on the head. It, it wasn't just sort of an immediate spit, uh, thrust of the spit. Um, so he, uh, you know, starts kind of picking on you, calling you names, shoving you around a little bit, turns into a scuffle, he gets me in the headlock, he spits on my head. This was on a Monday. And I did not like that at all. I can tell you that right now. But I was not a fighter, okay? I, I, I wasn't the kind of kid who was aggressive. I wasn't the kind of kid who wanted to get in a fight. The last thing I wanted to do was get in a fight with this kid. But Tuesday came along, and here he came again. And it happened again. He pushes me around. He starts calling me names, asking me if I want to fight. No, I don't want to fight. Come on, come on, you're afraid. Yes, I'm afraid. He grabs me, <laughs> spits on my head. I did not like that at all. Went to the bathroom, washed out my hair. The next day, lo and behold, here comes the bully again. Okay, and I don't know, I don't know what happened inside of me, but this kid, he comes up, he starts calling me names, he starts pushing me around, and I was like, look, let me tell you something right now. I don't care if you beat me up. I don't care if you want to show your friends and everyone else that you're tougher than I am and you're gonna like beat up a seventh grader, you're the big eighth grader, you're gonna beat up a seventh grader and show everyone how weak I am and how strong you are, that's great. If that's what you're gonna do, then do it. Beat me up. But do not spit on my head. 
And you know what was so funny? I mean, I just I braced myself. I was I was like, I'm just gonna get the crap kicked out of me right now. And you know what he did? I mean, you can probably guess, but he just turned around and he walked away. He completely lost interest in me. And I realized at that moment a lesson that I have carried with me for the rest of my life since then. What bullies really want to do is they want to fear, they want you to fear them, they want to intimidate, they want to talk. But if you suddenly show that you're not afraid of them anymore, if you stand up to them, it, 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 they completely lose their power over you. And um, sometimes I say, as, as I got older then, when I saw bullies picking on other kids, I'd speak up, hey, what are you doing? Why don't you leave that kid alone? Well, all of a sudden it like disarms them, right? They don't know what to do. Um, and one thing I would say as a journalist, that sometimes how I like to describe my job is that I stick up to bullies. So there are, I find people who are getting abused in some way, I find people who are powerless or who are oppressed in some way by some other more powerful person or entity taking advantage of them, and I expose it. I write stories about it. I name the name of the uh, oppressing force uh, or institution. Um, I put the facts together and show what's going on, and through doing that, it oftentimes brings about a lot of change. Um, so it's a very empowering thing. Um, another, uh, one more story here. So this is, uh, this is a man named G. William Oakley. So this guy, um, I worked for a place called the Heritage Square Opera House when I was about, I don't quite remember my, my age, I think I was about 15 years old, and I carved roast beef. It was a dinner theater, and this is where I first fell in love with, with uh, roast beef, believe it or not. Anyway, I loved this job, and I worked this job my whole summer between, I guess it was like sophomore year of high school or something. And I had all these great friends at this job. Anyway, one day I show up for work and they say, you know what, go, everyone go home. They shut the place down. They closed the dinner theater right out from under us. Anyway, we were all totally disappointed, totally bummed out. This is G. William Oakley. He was the owner of the dinner theater. And he was also um, the playwright who wrote all of the plays. They did these like vaudeville type plays. And he, uh, he, you can kind of tell, he looks like kind of a vaudeville kind of villain from one of these, <laughs> these comedy plays. He kind of got into it. He, he was also an actor. Um, anyway, uh, Bill, as we knew him, um, I had never met him. He would just kind of drink at the bar all night. Um, and none of us, I mean, I was just a little lowly uh, worker on the, on the buffet line. I mean, I didn't know Bill. But what they told us was, Bill can't afford to pay anyone. The company's gone out of business. Well, I was like, well, wait a minute. I mean, Bill owes me like three weeks of pay. In fact, he owed all of us about three weeks of pay. And everyone was mad, especially we, I was mad because he had opened another dinner theater across town. <laughs> so he shuts ours down, but his same umbrella company, we're like, well, wait a minute. How does he, how's he operate the other dinner theater? Like, I'm not that old, but I can kind of put two and two together. I'm like, hey, he, he can operate the other dinner theater, but he can't pay me? I mean, what's up with that? So. A bunch of us, we were mad, you know, we're all in like high school, we didn't know what to do. A bunch of people went and started picketing the other dinner theater, like, Bill doesn't pay his high school employees, you know. Uh, and me, uh, I just didn't think get into that very much. And it was my mom's idea. My mom said, you know what, you should sue him. And I was like, sue him? What are you talking about? I'm about high school. Like, well, I can't even drive yet. And she said, no, a small claims court. You could take him to small claims court. She explained to me what it was, and I was like, oh, that sounds good. So me and my buddy Brian uh, DeMarteau, who's now an attorney, um, <laughs> uh, he's not actually a practicing attorney, but he did get his law degree, but um, he, uh, my mom drove me down to the courthouse, and I pulled the little small claims court paperwork, and I wrote, I, I brought it home, and I remember writing up the thing about what happened and how I had been wronged and how he owed me this money, and put in my claim. I think it was about three hundred and forty dollars. Um, and uh, lo and behold, I, I turned it in. You pay like ten bucks to file it or something. I turned the thing in, and um, about I don't know, weeks later, a few weeks later, or something, I get this notice in the mail. You have a court date, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know what to expect, but I was like, well. I better be ready. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. So I get all ready. I remember when the court day was coming, I got all prepared. I thought I was going to have this big Perry Mason moment. You know, I was going to like go in, I was going to make my case in front of a judge and have a big oration, you know. And um, uh, I remember going in, it was kind of anticlimactic in one way because it was just some administrative 
clerk in like a conference room. It wasn't like a real big uh, courtroom scene or anything. But the thing that shocked me most was that there in that room was Bill himself and Bill's attorney. And I was like, what? I was like, I'm like 15 years old and like, he had to show up for this thing. Like, this is amazing to me, you know? I'm like, the power of the system. Um, anyway, so I get prepped for this, for this, you know, debate here with, with uh, Bill. I mean, I guess it's gonna be me and his attorney going head to head, right? Um, and and, the, and the, the judge guy, he just, he just looks at uh, Bill and his attorney and he's like, he, he read my little thing. And he goes, hey, is this, is this true, what, what happened with these kids? Like, you closed the business, but you kept the other one open, and then you didn't pay them their money? And Bill and his attorney were like, yeah. And the guy goes, well, you need to give these kids their money. And lo and behold, he wrote me a check, and I got my money, and I left. <laughs> and I was like, what kind of a world do we live in? Like, the little guy can actually win sometimes. I'm not saying it happens a lot, you know, the reason the story of David and Goliath is a good story is because it is so rare for David to win. Usually Goliath just stomps David. I mean, that's just usually the way these stories work. Um, but what I realized from that story was, you know what? Sometimes the little guy can win and can have his voice heard. And that's another lesson that I've, I've really tried to carry um, into, uh, into my journalism. Like, sometimes the power of just one person's story has so much moral force behind it that it can just change, it can just bring about a ton of change and a ton of reform. And so you might think, or even just you telling one little story, you might not have any idea what type of huge ripple effects those stories will have. Um, so another last story here is, is really about how I um, really committed myself to my faith. So I became a Christian. My parents were really um, devout Christians and raised me to be a um, uh, to follow Jesus. I accepted Christ when I was a kid. I was probably like seven or eight years old. But you know, you don't quite really understand what it's about when you're that age. And when I got to be about 15 or 16, um, I kind of came to a point where I, I realized that the way I'd been living my Christian life was like, you know, Christian on Sunday, and maybe at the youth group on Wednesday night. But the rest of the week, I mean, I wasn't like any kind of bad kid in any kind of like way that anyone would think of a bad kid. Um, but I was a total hypocrite. I mean, I was just like, you know, if Peter denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed, I mean, I denied Christ like three times before the lunch bell rang. I mean, I was like, you know, I was very ashamed of my faith because I was so insecure about it. I wanted to be liked by people, and I could tell that other people weren't Christians, and then I wondered, well, am I supposed to do what they want me to do, or what am I? Anyway, I was just trying to figure myself out. Um, but I really realized that like being that kind of lukewarm Christian really wasn't the best option, and it really wasn't something that's was pleasing to God. And so I kind of came to a point, like probably a lot of you have, where you reach a point of maturation where you're like, you know, I seem to be open about my faith and be open about who I am, and um, and also put my security in the Lord and not put my security in what other people are thinking about me. And that's kind of a step that a lot of people take. Uh, probably every believer I've ever known has had to make that transition, you know, at some point. Um, but for me. Um, it, it has led me in my journalism then just to be open about who I am and be open about my faith. And the, the really uh, counterintuitive thing is it's, it's never been a problem, you know? So um, I've, I've never had, I mean, you know, there's always going to be somebody, you know, who feels antagonistic about Christians. There's always going to be people who are going to, you know, want to make comments or there's maybe an atheist who feels like they need to try and, you know, be the person to cause you to have that doubt, you know, or something like that. Um, but, but that's not actually the norm. I mean, most of the time, um, people are very cool with it. Some people are interested, some people aren't. Um, but it's never been something that has um, held me back in my journalism career at all. And um, again, so, so if anybody were to say, like, um, Christians are somehow discriminated against or something in the media, I haven't experienced that. So maybe that's been the, the case for someone else. Um, but that, that hasn't been the case uh, for me. Um, so how did I get to journalism? Well, so I had no career plan, as I think I said. Um, I had no clue. Uh, if you hadn't noticed from my stories, I was kind of a goofball kind of a kid. I had no journalism experience. I had no journalism training. Um, and I had no career plan when I was growing up. I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to be a dad, so I knew that that was important to me. Um, and 
So I, I grew up in Colorado. Um, I got a degree from the University of Colorado in English uh, because frankly that was just kind of the easiest uh, degree for me to get. Um, and then I met and married my wife, Sonia. And my wife, Sonia, um, her parents were on staff with a Christian organization called The Navigators. I don't know if you've heard of The Navigators, but it's a very large organization that's focused mostly on discipleship. Um, and they had grown up, she had been a missionary kid. So she was born in Norway, and then she lived in Kenya uh, for 10 years. And so when she came to the United States to live full time, she was 15 years old. So for her, when I met her and we got married, I was only 22, she was 23. For her, she always envisioned like living overseas. And so I had never envisioned really anything other than getting married to her. Um, so we looked into some different ministry opportunities and other like teaching English type of opportunities and found this position with Young Life um, doing ministry at the International School of Kenya. Um, we weren't on staff at the school, but basically, you know, Young Life, the way, um, for those of you who don't know, it kind of comes alongside schools and campuses and um, I served as a coach, we substitute taught, we did a lot of different things there. And then we ran kind of like a Young Life ministry, you know, which really in, in Kenya was more like doing like a Bible study and then lots of really fun events with the students. Um, and really had a great time doing that. And looking back on it now, it's funny because I really loved writing the newsletters, you know, like most missionaries who raise their own support. Um, a lot of them, like the, the newsletters were like the most burdensome part of it, you know. For me, it was like the most fun, like, oh, I'm going to do another newsletter. I mean, I had so many ideas and things I wanted to write. Um, it's just funny how like the thing that you start doing naturally, uh, just when you don't have to do it, might be a good thing to try and do for a living if you can find a way to do that. Um, so after three years in Kenya, we came back and I worked in the Young Life headquarters in Colorado Springs. And that's when I started attending Fuller Seminary. Fuller Seminary had a satellite campus in Colorado Springs. I started going to school there. Um, and then that's also where I started freelance writing. So a friend of mine had been freelancing for these Christian magazines, and I was looking at the magazines one time, and I was like, who writes this stuff anyway, you know? I mean, I could probably do that. And he was like, well, the editors, I mean, they need writers, and they don't pay anything, so what do they have to lose? And, um, or they pay very, very little. So. I started calling myself a freelance writer, and it's amazing. As a freelance writer, you can just like send an email to an editor and say, my name is Marshall Allen, and I'm a freelance writer, and I have a story idea I wanted to pitch to you. And they don't know who you are or how much experience you have, and sometimes they're just desperate enough, they give you the idea, or they give you the assignment, and then all you have to do is figure out a way to land it. Um, and so that's how I started freelancing. And so I, I enjoyed kind of the hustle of that, I wrote for a lot of Christian, small Christian magazines, and then I kind of moved up in the Christian market to um, do writing for Christianity Today and other magazines like that. Um, and so I did so much of this freelancing, we left Young Life staff and moved out to Pasadena so I could finish full time at Fuller's main campus. Um, and I kind of came to a crossroads. My wife was the one who pointed out, like she was like, you should go into the media full time, you really enjoy this. And I was like, I should. So. I finished at Fuller, um, and the only question I had then was, do I go into the Christian media or do I go into the uh, mainstream media? And I wanted to reach my full potential as a journalist, and the best journalism is being done in the mainstream media. I mean, that's, um, that was true then, that's, I think it's true today. I mean, I was reading like the LA Times or the Atlantic Monthly or the New Yorker. I mean, I, I really aspired to do the best possible work. I've always just said I want to reach my full potential as a journalist, and so I go into the um, secular media from the Christian media. It'd be a lot easier if I wanted to to go from the secular media to the Christian media, but it's 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 not easy to go from Christian to secular in that way in that in this business. Um, the Christian media is probably seen as a little more advocacy oriented, I think, so there's a little more of a bias against it. And then. Um, a third reason was I had had some experience, a third reason I went into the mainstream media, I'd had some experiences in the Christian media that just made me uncomfortable in terms of, um, I guess to say the ethics, I mean, to be quite honest. Um, it seemed like uh, at some of the Christian magazines where I did some work, there was almost this, under, it, was like a, it was like a fear of muckraking, I would say. It was like a, an unwillingness or a reticence to tell stories that in some ways might make a Christian leader look bad. And I, I felt like, um, you know, sometimes just when you tell the truth about something, it is going to make someone look bad. And if they happen to be a Christian leader, I'm sorry for them, but it's still, the truth is the truth. And if it's a story that's in the public interest, then I think that this, those stories should be done. 
But it seemed like, um, if I had to describe it, I would say it seems sometimes like the Christian media was more like they wanted to do PR for God. And really, God doesn't need us to do PR for him. God can handle himself. What God needs us to do is tell the truth about things. So through those circumstances, I realized that, that the Christian media was probably not the place to me, uh, for me. But I, I do think that in our Christian subculture, there's something about muckraking that makes people uncomfortable. And there's something about uh, this business of, uh, of the media that makes people uncomfortable. And so I don't know exactly why it is that it, going into journalism isn't more encouraged in the, uh, in the kind of churches that we grew up in. Um, but for whatever reason, it's not. But um, I wanted to address that a little bit here and, and really talk about, is it biblical to be a journalist or even a muckraking journalist? Is being a muckraking journalist, as I've defined it, consistent with uh, what the Bible teaches? Um, so first of all, let's just look at what journalism is, okay? So this is a, a very influential book uh, for me. came out in 2001 called The Elements of Journalism uh, by Bill Kovac and Tom Rosenstiel. Rosenstiel. And it lays out nine elements of journalism. Um, this is a great book, by the way. I guess Paul uses it, he said in his teaching. Um, I, again, I knew nothing about journalism, so I read a lot of these books. But journalism's first obligation is to the truth. Its first loyalty is to citizens. Its essence is a discipline of verification. Its practitioners must maintain an independence from those they cover. It must serve as an independent monitor of power. It must provide a forum for public criticism and compromise. It must strive to make the significant interesting and relevant. It must keep the news comprehensive and proportional, and its practitioners must be allowed to exercise their personal conscience. Now, I'm not going to talk about all those elements um, of journalism, but those are kind of the key, like, what is journalism? That kind of sums it up. Um, now, in this comparison I'm going to make here, I'm not equating modern journalism with the Bible, but I will say that I'm sure glad that when God inspired the writers of the Bible, he didn't have them avoid sharing controversial truths. So I want you to pitch yourself in the shoes here of one of the authors of one of the books of the Bible. Um, so let's say that you're Luke, okay? And you have felt led by whatever, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, let's say. You might not even know that it's the Holy Spirit leading you at the time, right? But you feel led um, to document the stories about Christ, and you're going to tell the stories. Um, so I, just for fun, I went through the Gospel of Luke, and I want to think about this from Luke's perspective, okay? So all of us are in Luke's shoes, and here's how he describes his mission um, in uh, the first few verses of the book of Luke. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind... Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. So Luke here, I'm not saying Luke is a journalist, but Luke is really fulfilling some of those same roles of the elements of journalism, right? I'm gonna, he's going to investigate carefully everything that happened. He's going to um, write down an orderly account, and he's going to do that so that Theophilus and then others, I mean, I'm sure he did know that this was going to be publicly uh, displayed and shared, so that others would know the certainty of what they've been taught. So he has set out to do a lot of things that we as journalists would also set out to do. Verify the truth, publish it, right? So now let's think about what Luke actually published. There is some really controversial stuff um, in the book of Luke. Um, I just went through it and just picked out some. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he praises the hated Samaritans and holds them up as, as an example of what it means to love your neighbor, and in the process insults the religious leaders. He has harsh messages. Jesus tells a man who wants to bury his father become, before coming to follow him to let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, that section in um, 
chapter 11 where Jesus has all these woes. It's basically like Jesus laying a smackdown on all the religious leaders and Pharisees and teachers of the law with some like serious insults. He talks about the cost of following Jesus in chapter 14. Anyone who does not hate, and hate his father and mother is not worthy of being a disciple. He talks about the exclusivity of Christ. He says many will not be able to enter through the narrow door. He shows Jesus driving the sellers and money changers out of the temple. He, he, he tells the story of Judas, okay? Judas betraying Jesus. So this isn't just some Christian leader. This is one of Jesus' main followers. Is a total scoundrel. Betrays Jesus unto death. Sells him out. And Luke documents that in the book. And then has the audacity to publish the thing. So 2,000 years later, we're looking at this. And we read it like blah, 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 blah. I mean, this was a radical, radical thing that Luke did. In Luke 22, after the Last Supper... Um, the disciples, uh, several of them dis dispute with one another about which one of them will be the greatest. So these are the people who uh, are like the founding fathers of this uh, faith that we have, uh, some of them, very influential. And after the Last Supper, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. These are, he's making them out to look like some kind of petty people. And then, and then the, a great one in 22 where Peter denies Jesus three times, okay? So Peter, you know, the rock upon which the church is built. Luke publishes the story about Peter denying Christ three times. So just a few observations about Luke. And, and believe me, I mean, the Bible is full of these examples. So Luke, in writing and publishing this book, made the followers of Jesus look like complete idiots. He also made prominent and respected people of that day look like corrupt and conniving murderers. So he didn't avoid controversy. He named names. He didn't just say, like, one of the disciples denied Christ. He was like, Peter. It was Peter denied Christ. He seemed to go where the story led him. He verified the facts. And then he reported them truthfully in a straightforward manner. I'm not saying, again, that Luke was a journalist. I'm not saying, I'm certainly not saying that anything that I ever do as a journalist or that we do as journalists is anything like scripture. But there are characteristics and principles that we can take from this type of reporting and that we can apply to our work. So does this kind of reporting make people uncomfortable? Yes, it does. Yes, it uh, makes people very uncomfortable. Journalists question authority. They don't back down. They don't fall into line. They create controversy. It makes people very uncomfortable. And yet, um, for me, that type of just truth-telling really appealed to me. I mean, in terms of my personality, in terms of my understanding of what it means to be um, a, a faithful Christian, um, that really was something that appealed to me, and I, I hope that it appeals to you, too. And even though sometimes that type of truth-telling is discouraged even in our churches, um, we shouldn't run away from it. We need more truth-telling like that in our churches. And so it's going to take courageous young people like yourselves to actually be willing and to be bold enough uh, to tell those kinds of truths, whether it's um, just in your personal lives or whether it's some someday uh, through your journalism. So in terms of... When I, so the decision was made, clearly I needed to enter the mainstream media. So then the question was, okay, well, so how do I get a job in the mainstream media? Okay, so I finished at Fuller Seminary in May of 2001. And I mean, I was as green as a person can be. The fact that you all are sitting in this lecture gives you much more experience in the media than I ever have, okay? So um, I read the LA Times every day uh, at that time. So I thought, well, I'll just call the LA Times. I'll see, maybe, who knows, maybe they'll, maybe they've got a spot for me. Um, so I call up the recruiter at the LA Times, and he's like, uh, no. He's like, uh, how much experience do you have? And I said, well, I've written for some, you know, small Christian magazines. I just graduated from Polar Seminary. He's like, no. He's like, we kind of hire, here at the LA Times, he's like, we kind of want people to have at least, you know, five to ten years of experience. We're kind of picking the best people from the other mid-sized daily papers around the country. And I was like, okay, so it's a no then. Um, and I said, well, where, where should I go? So he pointed me to this, um, the LA Times owned these community papers. And there was this one called the Foothill Leader, which was in a town kind of next to mine. And so I applied to the Foothill Leader. Again, this was small time. Um, 
uh, twice weekly paper. I think it published on Wednesdays and Sundays or something. And I was assigned to cover this small town. Um, even when they hired me, I wasn't their first choice. It was kind of funny, like, you don't really realize some things sometimes until, like, after the fact, and then you kind of go, you know, so I had been in the job for, like, two weeks. So they called me and said, hey, you want the job? I was like, great, yeah, yeah. So they hired me, I'm sitting there, I'm doing the job for a couple weeks. And then I find out that I wasn't their first choice. They'd actually hired this other lady, um, but for whatever reason, actually because she had a DUI on her record, um, they had to let her go because the company's insurance policy wouldn't allow her to be on their insurance because of her DUI. And so I was like the runner-up, I guess. So anyway, whatever it takes, right? Um, sometimes it's just like being the one that they can reach is all you need to get the job. Nowadays with some of these websites, I guess it's two or three dozen a day. Um, but in doing those repetitions, you learn to manage your time, you learn to cultivate your sources. I think a lot of times young people, just like me, I was calling the LA Times, right? I wanted to work at the LA Times. I read the LA Times every day. I want to write for the LA Times every day. Well, we all need to be realistic. I mean, if you don't have a lot of experience, you probably need to start at the bottom and climb your way up. And there's a real, a lot of value in that. Very few people are just sort of these prodigious talents who can just start at the top and really thrive there. There's a lot of value in, um, in kind of learning as you go. Um, so you also learn to write doing it that way. The repetitions of just learning to write are really valuable. Um, after about five years of these three different papers in LA, I went to Las Vegas. Um, and Las Vegas, you know, again, like if there's one thing kind of funnier than being a Christian in journalism, it's being a Christian in journalism in Las Vegas, right? Um, which uh, is called Sin City for a good reason. Although one thing I would say about this, just an observation about Vegas compared to other places in the country, um, in Las Vegas, it's Sin City and everyone knows it. Other places, it's Sin City and people don't really know it. They don't acknowledge it. Like in Vegas, um, people realize their brokenness. I mean, that's how I would say it after living there for five years. Um, I would not have chosen to work in Las Vegas. Let me be clear about that. That's not a place I ever aspired to go to. Um, but no one else would hire me. I mean, I applied for dozens of jobs everywhere. Nobody would give me an interview. I mean, the media was contracting at the time, and I know you guys are, are dealing with the same kind of thing too if you're looking for jobs. Um, but uh, they were having a hard time getting reporters to come to Vegas because it's not the most appealing place, especially for people with families. They don't want to go there. Um, and so it was kind of the perfect marriage. We were both desperate. We couldn't find any other match. And so I needed them. They needed me. So boom, there I was in Las Vegas, right? Um, but what's funny is that God, you know, the paper had recently... Um, revamped itself to focus on more investigative reporting, more narrative storytelling. They hired some amazing editors um, from the LA Times and other great publications. And so it was really a perfect place for me to come as kind of a, a person, I'm still a person who's learning, but I mean a person who's had a key point in his development, to go there under the hand of some really seasoned editors was really valuable. Um, and while I was there too, my editor asked me to cover healthcare. And honestly, the first words out of my mouth when he said, he took me to lunch, he's like, I want to talk to you. Marshall, we want you to cover healthcare. And I said, I can't imagine anything more boring than writing about healthcare. Um, and that's honestly how I felt. I think I had read so many lame stories, like especially uh, in healthcare, you get scores of press releases every day. There's so much money in it. If you want to be a journalist who just turns around stories off press releases, I mean, it'd be a really easy thing to do. But I was so wrong about it being a boring beat. Um, what I realized right away is that healthcare is so deeply important to people's lives. Um, I also learned, in terms of my interest in um, investigative reporting, the healthcare system is so dysfunctional in this country. It is so broken, and it is, it is such need of reform that there are great investigative opportunities all over the place. And I don't mean just broken in a minor way. They say, they estimate that between two and 400,000 people a year die because of harm that they suffer while undergoing care in hospitals. So medical mistakes, medical errors, infections, preventable injuries are killing hundreds of thousands of people a year in this country. And 
it's not getting better. All the estimates are that it's getting worse. Also, healthcare is huge money. So it's about a fifth of the U.S. economy is spent on healthcare. And in 2009, there was a study that the Institute of Medicine put out that estimated that $765 billion was wasted by the medical industry. And that's, for reference, that's more than the entire budget of the Department of Defense. So we are wasting hundreds of billions of our taxpayer dollars and our insurance premium dollars in healthcare every year. Um, as soon as I started doing um, uh, healthcare stories, I, I just had so many crazy individual stories. If my editor wanted me to do a deep dive investigative story about why healthcare in Vegas was the way it was. Like, was there something about Las Vegas that made the healthcare worse? Um, and actually, I don't think that there is. I think that the, there's problems with the healthcare everywhere in this country. Um, but I collaborated with a colleague of mine uh, who does data work, uh, Alex Richards, to publish this project called Do No Harm. And with this project, what we did is we took um, publicly available data for the state of Nevada, and we analyzed it to identify injuries and infections and deaths that occurred to patients in the hospitals in Las Vegas. And then we published each hospital's number of these types of injuries and infections and problems in a way that um, had never been done before. So you could actually see how some hospitals um, just kind of quantifying the amount of harm that was taking place. And I talked to dozens of patients who had been harmed and made this a big project. Um, that, was a, that was a project that uh, won a lot of awards for us. That one published in 2010. And then in 2011, I came to ProPublica. I just celebrated my five-year anniversary with ProPublica. And I continued to cover healthcare with an emphasis on um, the problem of patient harm, uh, which I talked about earlier. ProPublica, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's funded by philanthropy. It's been around for about eight years. Um, it is, um, you know, the mission is to do watchdog reporting. I, I read the, the mission statement earlier. We have about two dozen more what I would call people like me, like traditional reporters, and then we have about a dozen um, journalists who are focused more on data and programming. And if that's something that interests you at all, or if you have any leaning toward that, there is a huge market right now in journalism for uh, journalists who have data skills. And so if you want to like, you know, um, have an angle, an edge uh, for a job, learn to use data in a really smart way and you will be marketable right out of the gate. Um, anyway, like I said, I just, uh, ProPublic has won two Pulitzers in the last um, eight years since it's been in existence. And I think the thing I enjoy most about it is that um, each of the journalists there is a really world-class investigative reporter, and it's like a lab for investigative reporting. And so my colleagues are publishing groundbreaking, very interesting work every single day that makes me think, man, I need to bring my A-game today. Like, I have got to, to, uh, to keep doing what I do and get better at what I do because um, it's just a really healthy competition. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean that like we, I think we inspire each other to do better work. Um, uh, one thing I've enjoyed about ProPublica is um, the opportunity to kind of use some creative methods for investigative reporting. So we do a lot of crowdsourcing. I've been doing this project with a colleague of mine named Olga Pierce, who's um, one of these uh, data, she can do everything, but um, she does a lot of the data stuff for the work that we do. And um, one thing we did was we started this Facebook group for patients who have been harmed while undergoing medical care. So this is a group, it's a public group on Facebook, it's about 3,500 members now. I moderate that every day. And it's really a place, um, you know, there's so, I've talked to so many patients who have been harmed uh, while undergoing medical care that I just realized, like, I can't, I don't have the time to talk to all these people. And with social media, you can kind of put them all in the same room together online in a Facebook group. And with mod I mod we moderate the discussion to keep it fair and keep it constructive, but it gives them an opportunity to kind of share their stories with each other and comfort each other, give each other advice, give each help each other with information. Um, and then we can also um, follow up with any of these people for stories if we want to. And we learn so much by listening to this group. Um, another thing we've done for our crowdsourcing is we have um, a patient harm questionnaire, which is a big Google form where patients who've been harmed fill out a long survey, tell us what happened to them. That feeds into a Google form, and that allows us, we have more than about 1,100 of these stories now, and allow, that allows us to quantify trends about how patients are treated after they've been harmed. Um, and then the big kind of uh, 
project that we put out this year, uh, this last year, is called our Surgeon Scorecard. And this is where we kind of built on that work that we did in Las Vegas by getting Medicare data. Medicare is the government's insurance plan for people over age 65. And there's publicly available data that you can buy that um, is a record of every Medicare case, every hospital case, for every Medicare patient for years at a time. So we have five years of this data. And working with lots of experts and lots of surgeons and lots of doctors, um, we kind of came up with a way to analyze this data so that you could identify cases where someone went into on the hospital for like a knee replacement or a hip replacement or some other common elective surgery and suffered some type of an infection or an injury or death. Um, and then what we did is we tabulated those. So we published the complication rates for um, doctors all over the country, about 17,000 doctors in every hospital around the country. That type of transparency has never been um, done before in healthcare, and it's a big motivating uh, force for change because when doctors have their complication rates published, it gives patients the information they need to choose the safest care, and then also doctors are competitive and they want to get better, and so they can see how they compare to others and they can see what they need to do to improve. Um, with the scorecard, as I said, uh, um, the way Olga, my colleague, and I divide up our labor, um, she does the hands-on kind of data analysis part, which is very technical. Um, I don't have those data skills. Um, what I do is I go more out in the country, um, go to hospitals all, all in different states, talk to doctors, talk to patients, share their results with them, um, write the story, things like that. Um, and it, it was a, a very fascinating project to work on. I think the biggest surprise for us was just how few <coughs> hospitals and surgeons were actually tracking their own complication rates. And so, you know, in order to improve something, you have to measure it. And unfortunately, our medical community does not spend a lot of time even measuring the quality of care um, that's being delivered. Um, the scorecard um, had some uh, explosive uh, response. I mean, the, the, it's a searchable news application, so you can go to the website, you can type in the name of a surgeon, you can type in your location, you can type in a hospital, and it'll pull up the complication rates uh, for people near you. Um, and the, we got a lot of uh, response. I mean, uh, millions of people have used the site. Um, we have, if you Google ProPublica Surgeon Scorecard, you'll see they've created a lot of controversy. I mean, medical <laughs> journal articles about us and uh, criticizing us, very controversial, um, because a lot of people in the medical community, you know, don't like this or they quibble with our methods or something like that. Um, but it's also had a very positive response in the medical community because in hospitals around the country, um, I hear from people talking about how they're focused on uh, reducing their complication rates uh, like they never have before because now this information is publicly reported. Um, so let me sum up before we do a little Q&A here by talking about what does it really mean to be a Christian journalist. And um, I would say it's like being a Christian in any other field. I mean, I I'm, don't mean to de -stig I'm trying to destigmatize this a little bit. Um, and maybe it's even easier in some ways because what I do is so consistent as I think I've shown a little bit here with um, what I think we are called to live, live by as, um, as believers. And so, like a believer in any field, I try and focus on doing what I do with excellence under the Lord. I try and focus on being a person of integrity. Um, like a believer in any other field, when I make mistakes, you know, I try and admit it. You know, I've had, I've had times at work where I've mouthed off to someone in an email in some way I shouldn't have, and I've had to go apologize to them. I mean, you know, I think, um, I think these are things that a Christian in any field would do. Um, I try and be receptive to criticism, you know, when my editors try and like guide me or correct me or tell me to do something that they want me to do. I try and be receptive to that and I try and learn um, from them and others around me. And I guess like anyone in any field, I'm being stretched and growing and, and that's kind of what it means to live the Christian life. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to questions. I, I hope you all have some questions. And um, if there's anything I haven't talked about that you are curious about, please uh, let me know. Great. And get the mic straight behind oh, you, Allison. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm Allison, and I'm from Abilene Christian in Texas. And this might sound like an uninformed question, but would you ever consider publishing like, some of the nurses that are like, malpractice or anything 
I know there's plenty of them. Like that would take forever, but I yeah, know. like you mean stories about malpractice? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much like that's what I do every day. Do you include nurses though? Because I know. Sure. They, oh, great. Okay. I mean, what I've been focused on with this project is surgeons and surgery, mm -hmm. um, but we've done stories about nurses too. Um, it's just. I think one thing with what we do at ProPublica is you want to try and you're really putting all your eggs in one basket. I mean, the Surgeon Scorecard project took us years. Um, I did I did scores of other stories during that time, but these big stories, I mean, take these big projects take a year easily. So you're really trying to figure out what's going to be like the maximum impact with us with a story. What's the biggest story I can do in a year? Um, so. Um, but some colleagues of mine at ProPublica did an amazing project about um, nurses and the poor oversight of nurses. That answers my question, thanks. Thank you. Uh, looks like Ben Lyon with a question, and then Issa over here. So let's go to Ben first. Um, hi, I'm Ben. I live here in New York City. Um, so early on, when you were a teenager, you were inspired to have faith in the system by your experience in that courtroom <laughs> in California. Do you ever have? Are you ever concerned that muckraking um, basically creates uh, cynicism in society or weakens people's faith in the system? Is there a way to do it in a way that promotes faith in the system? Um, I mean, if the academy and the media are all about speaking truth to power, um, who inspires people to have faith in the system at the same time? Uh, yeah, my goal isn't to inspire people to have faith in the system. Uh, in fact, I would say the system is usually what's failing people, um, or the lack of a system, or just the brokenness of a system. Um, so I think, yeah, it's almost like um, what I really learned um, through that experience as a kid was that, you know, sometimes the system does work, you know, um, but in terms of like whether I feel a responsibility to like uphold the system no I mean if there's something broken and people are getting hurt because of it or people's voices aren't being heard um, or they're being somehow taken advantage of and the, and the systems part of the problem then we absolutely want to expose that and because I think when you expose it and you identify the problems it gives people an opportunity and the motivation to correct it and improve it no, I've been thinking a lot about this question and the interplay between press freedom, religious freedom, uh, economic freedom, and and political freedom. Yeah. You know. I would love to answer this. Okay, I'm gonna we'll come over to Issa now. Let's yeah. hear your question. Yeah. Yeah. Just, tell uh, tell uh, tell uh, yeah. tell us what you're working on, Issa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Issa Mansari. I'm the editor of the Africa Paper, and I'm currently a two-night uh, entrepreneur journalism fellow that is looking at the business side of journalism. Um, at CUNY currently, I'm based in Minneapolis. So uh, coming to what Paul was saying, my concern is about press freedom, human rights issues, and of course, um, our faith issues related to journalism. Uh, looking at Africa, for example, we have many stories of colleagues in prison. Before starting the Africa paper, I was the assistant Africa researcher at the International Press Institute in Vienna. So looking at what is happening in the continent and of course looking at what is happening here again with the changing landscape in journalism, uh, what is public thinking in terms of uplifting other colleagues in journalism, be it the newsroom where you have all the opportunities and facilities there to do investigative journalism and the resources. So in terms of the younger generation, the new generation of journalists here in the US and maybe across continents, so looking at faith, looking at um, press freedom, looking at um, human rights issues. Thank you. And so I'm sorry, your question is? Uh, my question is, what is ProPublica doing in terms of these, looking at these um, problems across continents, say, be it in Africa or here, is and it? uplifting the next generation of journalists? Well, I can, I can <laughs> talk about in terms of um, you know, training journalists and the next generation of journalists. We have a lot of programs, um, fellowship programs to do that, um, that are funded by Google and the Knight Foundation and others, especially on the data side, that's one thing ProPublica does a lot. Um, I'm not the person to ask about the direction of ProPublica. I mean, I'm really like a worker bee in the hive at ProPublica. Um, I'm not making decisions for the organization or uh, setting, um, you know, the path forward in terms of, um, what the organization would do. Um, 
And so in terms of like training young journalists, we do a lot of that. Um, but I, I don't know of anything um, in terms of the other things that you're talking about. How do you look at how professional journalism gets paid for going forward? Well, that's kind of a question that's a little bit outside my pay grade. Um, yeah. Honestly, I am so consumed with my day-to-day -day, um, job and trying to deliver um, these top-notch investigative projects that I, I honestly, to be, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time studying or thinking about the pay models or things like that. Um, you know, ProPublica is obviously probably what if not the highest profile, one of the highest profile of the nonprofit kind of journalism models. Um, and we've had a lot of success in that way, but I also know that not all the nonprofit journalism models have had the same success, you know, and um, it, it can be a really tough way uh, to fund journalism. Um, so I, I'm sorry I don't have a, a very informed um, answer for you on that. That would be uh, something that someone else could speak to a lot better than myself. Okay, we got a question from Nick and then Caitlin over here. Yeah. I've heard, by the way, I've heard some, some people comparing journalists to Jedi Knights recently, especially investigative reporting, because they it kind of, you know, it's not a, it kind of die out at points, they lose limbs, you saw the last movie. Um, and, and so it's, but it's super important. And so to that point, we need to, a lot of us feel like we need to find ways to sustain it, you know, the rebel faction. So Nick. I'm Nick, I'm a student here at college. Um, my question is, for young journalists, uh, we have a lot of them in this room, as you said, uh, what is one thing that has made you competitive in your field as a journalist, but also a Christian journalist? Um, and how has being a Christian made you more or um, less competitive in terms of your abilities? So I, I don't think that like my faith has made me any more or less um, competitive. Like I really think at the end of the day, what the editors want is they want someone who can deliver a really good story on deadline. So it's always been clear to me, as long as I've been in the industry, um, that I just have to, you know, you just have to deliver what they want when they want it with really high quality work. Like there's just no, there's no forgiveness. There's no option. And at the end of the day, at the, until I came to ProPublica, you knew that layoffs were imminent, you know? So it's kind of like, boy, they're gonna be in a back room and they're gonna be talking about who they're gonna let go. Do you want your name to be the first one to come up? Um, the second one to come up? The third one to come up? So there's, there was always sort of this awareness, like, man, I, I need to deliver. I need to do a good job with a good attitude. I need to be the person who says yes to my editors as much as I can. So I think a lot of it is about having a good attitude. Um, uh, my faith certainly does guide that. Um, in terms of being competitive, um, so data skills are in such demand that they cannot find enough people who have data skills. So I would, you know, start training yourself, and there's so much you can do just on your own to learn how to use data. Um, so that's the number one thing that I would do. Um, another thing I would do is I would start blogging now. Start your own blog about whatever you're passionate about and build an audience. Like, you don't have to wait anymore to have the endorsement of some official publication to deem your work worthy of publication. There's a huge advantage that journalists these days have that we didn't have in my era. And that's just that you have your own opportunity to publish. So start publishing. I bet there's some really interesting stuff that you all could write. I think you could be really smart in the way that you write it. Um, and you know, it, it might just be terrible too. I mean, let's be real. But no one's going to read it. So um, if it's good, you'll you'll draw an audience. If it's bad, you won't. Um, and you'll you'll get better that way. And you can also um, establish a voice that way. And also, if you're really good, you can maybe get a job that way. So I, I would, those are things you could do right now. Hi, I'm Caitlin, I'm from the school. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know like, what kind of investigation you do. Is it usually just from data, or do you ever go behind the scenes and do like FBI stuff? Like undercover know. stuff? Yeah. No, so, like, um, 
I think and I think like the undercover stuff is like totally fun to watch like on you know whatever the TV show is whenever they do those things um, we don't do so like journalists have no we have no authority like you know a, a FBI agent or a law enforcement agent we're just like normal citizens who are just nosy um, <laughs> and persistent and who, who won't go away um, so we don't do anything, I don't do anything like undercover or anything like that. Some journalists do use some undercover methods, you know, hidden cameras, things like that. Um, I don't do it that way. I mean, um, my sort of method um, is to um, look at publicly available data, identify the story and the data. I have to collaborate, and I do collaborate with a colleague who's really good with working with data because I don't have the... the the skills to do it in the way that it needs to be done, um, at least at the level that I need to do it at and we need to do it at. Um, so, and then I go through the front door. So I call people up and I say, hey, here's what the data shows. Can you talk to me about it or what's going on? You know, or I, um, you know, there are some different ways to investigate things that aren't exactly going through the front door. So I don't always just go through the front door, but there aren't any surprises with what we do. Um, Nobody we name in a story who ends up looking, you know, bad in a story, it's never a surprise to them. Um, we always give people lots of opportunity to comment and tell their side of the story. I mean, one thing you learn is there's multiple sides to every story, and it's really important to get a very well-rounded story to make sure that it's really accurate and fair. Um, so, um, you know, but stories come through a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's a tip, you know, sometimes someone calls you up and tells you something, and then, um, you go and find documents, or you go find other people to corroborate it. Um, it's not always through data in, in terms of the starting point. I was saying for the major projects we do and the major investigations, it's you want to be able to quantify it, and data can really help quantify a story. Great. How about two or three more questions? So we have one here, and then Rachel. Yep, go ahead. Hi, Marshall. Thanks so much for your presentation today. My name is Warren May from New York City. And uh, you mentioned earlier that when you tell people about your background, it evokes uh, a response. And I was wondering, when that happens, do you get an opportunity to share your faith in that, in that situation? Or um, do people ask more about that? Or uh, how far does it go? And also, uh, what do you think is the role of a Christian in journalism with respect to uh, telling people about Christ, or, or, or just describing or explaining some of the issues that we have in the, in the media today when we're talking about Ted Cruz and Ben Carson and these people being Christians and we talk about the Muslim situation that's going on. Uh, what do you think is the role of Christian journalists with respect to explaining that and what kind of opportunity do you get to talk about your faith? So I mean I get tons of opportunities to talk about my faith because again it's in my bio and so it comes up a lot. Uh, it comes up with sources, it comes up with um, uh, especially like conferences or if people ask you know, what you do before your journalism and that kind of thing. Uh, that's one reason I ask them sometimes when they ask, how'd you get into journalism? Or sometimes I've had people say like, what are you doing here? Or, you know, like, did you have a crisis of faith that led you into journalism? Um, I mean, these are, I get those kind of questions a lot. And so then I tell them like, do you want the spiritual answer or do you want the secular answer? I can give you, if you really want to know, I can give you whatever response you want. I can give you the long version and the spiritual version or I can give you the short version. Tell me what you want. And usually people are interested. They want to hear about it. Um, and I think in terms of sharing your faith, I mean, I, you know, um, you know, I think in, in Peter it says, you know, always be prepared to have an answer for anybody who asks you about the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. And so um, I try and do that with gentleness and respect. Um, but again, um, it's not something, and then in terms of like, um, so that's just that's just interpersonal relationships, though, right? Or friendships you have with people, or um, you know, it's just a sort of natural way that you interact with people, I guess. Um, but I but I found uh, you know I I've, I've been in newsrooms where I've known there are other believers who no one knows they're a believer, you know they're they're kind of hidden about it, and I think that creates a real problem for them because then there's no opportunity to talk about it. Like you, then you have this sort of side of yourself that you're not you know, that you're not really talking about, and then it becomes more awkward to ever talk about it. So what I found is just by being open about who you are and what you believe, I mean, people are pretty cool with that. Like, most people aren't that interested, and that's okay. I mean, it's up to them if they're interested or not. I mean, you don't force 
yourself on people. Um, and then there are always some who are going to be antagonistic. And then I think uh, the goal there is to not get into arguments, you know, or not get into like a fight about it, you know. I mean, it's and and, and you know sometimes with people who are uh, antagonistic, you know, I'm always up for a debate, you know. So um, you don't have to be careful there not to turn it into something where suddenly we're arguing or something about this, you know, because these are colleagues and these are people we need to always be respectful of one another. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question about in terms of my faith influencing the work, um, I don't, you know, um, covering healthcare, it doesn't really come up a lot. Um, I used to cover religion uh, when I first started. Um, and there, I mean, I would always be explaining, you know, whether it's Christianity or some other faith. I mean, and there it's just accurately reporting the story. So it's letting people, it's showing them the respect to listen carefully to what they're saying and accurately represent what they're reporting. And you know, if they're not a Christian, I mean, I, I have no um, need to like, um, you know, slip in something that undermines what they're saying or something. If it's a story about something else, you, you report the story and report the truth of the, of the story. Um, right now would be a really interesting time to cover politics because you would have more opportunity, I think, to, to do something like that. Um, and I don't, again, I, I mean, it's a natural part of the story that I think could be addressed, you know. Okay, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a student here. Thank Hi. you for talking with us tonight. Um, when you transitioned from the mission field to journalism, what specific in what specific ways did you hone your journalism skills? Did you have mentors, or did you just write and write and write? What advice would you have um, for how we as young journalists can hone our skills? So there's lots. I mean, when I was freelancing, all those editors who would end up um, rewriting my work. You know, sort of served in a mentorship role because you turn something in. I mean, you know, I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know how to write a lead. I didn't know how to write a nut graph. I did not know a thing. I had some instincts, so I knew what a good story was, and I'm a people person, so I could kind of talk to people and get them to tell me stuff. But in terms of shaping it into a cohesive story, I mean, I was completely clueless. I mean, I could, you know, I'm not trying to make it sound like I was that bad, but I mean, I was really, I was really pretty bad, <laughs> considering <laughs> considering this material was getting published. So in terms of mentoring, um, you know, I always wanted somebody to kind of be like very proactive about mentoring me. And I remember we, um, when I was at the Pasadena Star News, actually, I had this great editor who had um, been at the LA Times for like 30 years. And this guy was just a seasoned uh, editor. And I remember asking him one time, I was like, hey, could we do some kind of like a little workshop kind of thing or something about how to write a lead or, um, you know, kind of a brown bag kind of lunch thing. and. He, he looks at me and he goes, Marshall, I like to think of every day around here as a workshop. <laughs> and what was, what was clear to me from that is that he, wasn't, he didn't want to spend any extra time holding my hand, but what he was going to do every day is show me how to do it. So I think the main, the main way I've learned and grown is through the editors who have um, kind of coached me and guided me along the way, usually just by... Um, correcting what I'm doing wrong, or telling me to stop doing that thing, or telling me to do more of this. I mean, they're your, they're your bosses, but they're also like much more experienced seasoned editors, and then they also have the um, advantage of having distance from the story. You know, when you do all the reporting, and then you write it yourself, or you produce this piece, you don't have the perspective, you know, you're kind of like, so you're so deep in the weeds that you can't really tell what the story needs to become a really great story. And so the editors can just step back and help you with that. Um, but usually it's more through um, a punishing process and a painful process of them just correcting you than it is like a nurturing, you know, we're going to like, you know, help you in, in a really kind of like soft way, you know. I don't mean that in a mean way. I just mean it's a matter of fact, especially when you're on a deadline and you've got to crank this stuff out. They're just getting it done. Um, uh, I have had to, I've, I've pursued like through organizations like the Association of Healthcare Journalists is an awesome organization where you can get more mentoring, get connected with a more experienced um, uh, journalist to uh, mentor you. So um, investigative reporters and editors is another great organization. All these organizations have mentoring programs for younger journalists. So I would join these associations. Um, if there's one of them that interests you, and then take advantage of what they have to offer. Tons of great training opportunities through those organizations. 
there's a few journalism professors in the room too. So would you, have, when you were at Colorado, would you have liked, looking back, would you have liked to have taken an intro recording class? Yeah. To have learned how to, how to do it would have been things? great. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a good idea to just jump into the media without knowing what you're doing. Um, but uh, it's just sort of how it happened for me. But yeah, and like internships, I mean, yeah, it would have been great. I would have loved to have had an internship, some classes. <laughs> My editors would have, would have thanked those professors a lot. They used to send me home with the AP style book, you know? Like, they'd be like, hey, read this tonight. I didn't know what AP style was, you know? So I start working at a, at a small paper doing two or three stories a day. I mean, imagine being my editor. I'm like cranking out these stories without knowing how to do it in the proper style. I mean, patient, patient. Yeah. There was, I saw another question somewhere in the back. How about that's our last question? And then we're gonna, we have plenty of food and drink. And I know some people probably have to get home, but let's, uh, we'll make this the last question. Hi, I'm Gloria, I'm a student here, and I was just wondering um, what's your biggest, what's been your biggest roadblock and how have you been able to get over that in your journalism career? My, my biggest roadblock? Well, like a roadblock, I don't know if you had any like um, issues, like... You mean like my trying, personal failings or... Oh no, like trying to find like a story or... Because that's what stuff. first came to mind. <laughs> So, um, if like you were maybe trying to find a story and maybe you got rejected, like a pitch or something, or how would you, something, some journalism issue, I guess. You know, I mean, journalism related is, is kind of the easy part because you just have to get over the roadblocks and get around the roadblocks and you can't ever have the roadblocks get in your way. Like, you just have to deliver and just do the job. Um, you know, my first thought was my pride. Of course, that's my biggest roadblock is my pride. I mean, that's the obvious one, right? Um, so I'm always thinking more, it's the personal stuff that's, that's the bigger roadblock in terms of our um, development or our maturity or our getting better at our job. Um, so, I mean, you know, not, you know, anybody who knows me would know that's probably true, so I'm not too embarrassed about saying it. But, um, so I can't really think of any roadblocks like that uh, because you just, you just have to blow past them, you know? You just have to be so persistent and just kind of keep going and not give up and not get discouraged. Um, so, I mean, it was really a struggle for those years when I was in LA and I couldn't get hired. You know, I couldn't, we had three kids, my wife and I had three kids living in a small two bedroom apartment. And I mean, I wasn't making much money and I knew it wasn't sustainable. And I mean, I was applying for jobs everywhere. I applied for probably two dozen jobs and I didn't get hired anywhere until we went to Las Vegas. And so um, the industry has thrown up a few roadblocks, but again, I mean, I, I look at where I am today and I'm like, I, I can't complain. I mean, if, if um, I feel like God spared me from all those other jobs. If I would have gotten to some of those jobs like the Rocky Mountain News, now dead. Uh, Newhouse News Service, now dead. I mean, there's a lot of those jobs where if I would have gotten them, I would probably be unemployed now or I'd be doing something else maybe. Um, so the roadblocks um, sometimes are just, uh, you know, in place for God to maybe turn you in a different direction, I guess. Well, I'm surprised nobody asked about your, what you're working on next and where this project you showed us is going. I thought that might be good for us to hear, right? Yeah. So we're going to continue. We're going to update the scorecard and do kind of scorecard 2.0. We're going to make some uh, small tweaks to it. Um, and then I have, a, you know, a slate of uh, other investigative medical stories on deck for this year. So I'm working intently on, on that for this year. And can we find this on Yelp? Is that right? Uh, it'll, it'll, it's supposed to be going up on Yelp down the road. Um, but right now, it's just on our website. Great. Well, let's thank Marshall Allen once again. Thank you.